Welcome coming in. Join me as we get curious about solving one of the longest standing medical mysteries. Welcome to the Dog Baron Show. Come for the stories, stay for the learning. Join our vibrant community, just hit the subscribe button and you become part of a global movement. With guests from astronauts who've traveled the vastness of space to philosophers harvesting the intricacies of the human spirit. Even presidential candidates trying to make sense of a world on the brink. We explore it all as we dive into episodes brimming with wisdom from global leaders, scientists, entertainers, philosophers, theologians, and journalists as we plunge into the depths of the most intriguing minds, The Dog Baron Show. This is more than another podcast. It's your passport to unparalleled insights. For the next two episodes, we welcome a guest whose story and insights will captivate and inspire you. She is a medical superstar. Dr. Azra Raza is a professor of medicine and clinical director of the Evans Foundation at Columbia University. Dr. Raza immigrated to the U.S. with one clear intention, to cure cancer. She has traveled a long way from where she grew up in Karachi, Pakistan, to the dining room of President Joe Biden at his home at the Naval Observatory in Washington, D.C. Dr. Raza was invited with a handful of other cancer specialists to offer her perspective on the cancer landscape, which contributed to what we now know as the Cancer Moonshot. She's been featured in the New York Times, The Guardian, The Times, The Smithsonian, and numerous other high-profile outlets. Her latest book is a best-selling book and is called The First Cell. It's a searing account of how medicine and society mistreat cancer and how we can do better and why we must. Her life is devoted to early detection of cancer prevention. Ladies and gentlemen, turn up the volume and help me welcome a wonderful human being I had the honor and pleasure of spending time with in 2023, named as one of the 100 women who matter by Newsweek. She is a medical genius, a poet, a philosopher, a warrior, and multiple best-selling author, Dr. Azra Raza. Welcome. I'm really, really, really excited to have you on here. It's It was such a pleasure to spend time with you last year. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Doug. Very excited to be here. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed our conversation. And it was wonderful of where you went to in our time together that I didn't expect. I'm always fascinated by that. You, you said that you've dedicated your life to early cancer prevention, so recognizing it, detecting it. And of course, you talk about that in your book, a lot of it. And what's clear from reading the book is that you've had to watch many good people die. When others might be justifiably overwhelmed by that and just pull the blankets over their head, what is it that gets you out of bed in the morning when other people would have just packed it in? Such a profound question. When the mother of a young girl who died of leukemia, her mother was asked, how can you stand it? Hmm. You know what she said? The answer was, I can't. Hmm. But I don't want her 12 years of life to be defined by her leukemia. And that's how I feel. I can't stand it. I can't say to you that, oh, with time it has become easy for me to walk so many patients to their deaths. Of course not. If anything, it is harder all the time. But I can't let that define either the patients because that would be causing their death twice. And I can't let that define me. Rather, I find inspiration in why and how we have to do better all the time. That's how I get out of bed, looking forward, actually excited to go to work and to be with my patients. That is what sustains me. And you know, the interesting thing about it is that when I first heard about you and your work, I thought you were, because I know you're doing amazing research, and I thought that that's what you were. I didn't realize that you're seeing, initially, you're seeing, was it 40 to 60 people a day? A week. A week, I mean? 40 to 60 people a week? That is crazy. Yeah. Aside from anything else, how do you find the time? To see all those people and do the research, and I know you've got one of the largest biosamples there is. So help us understand how, like, do you sleep? Mind detail, do you sleep? Everything is possible if we set our minds to it. And it's compartmentalization of things. I mean, they're so interconnected in my life that I can't tell the difference where I'm doing my research, where I'm seeing patients. I do every single bone marrow biopsy procedure with my own hands. So when I'm in clinic, I'll easily easily be doing seven to 10 bone marrow biopsies. That's a procedure. 
I draw research blood samples with my own hands to this day. And then I'll be walking to my lab to have my meeting and to conduct serious scientific experiments and to supervise all of that. Then back to the clinic. So it's like it's a seamless transition, which is on a continuous dynamic basis. And really, I don't find a clear separation of the two at all. I'm a translational researcher, which means at every level, I'm trying to translate insights we develop in the lab onto the bedside, but what the questions that arise in my mind come from the bedside that mm -hmm. must be addressed at the bench. So it's literally a bi-directional translational research. So let's go to the core of this for a minute before we go any further, because there's a lot in your own story. But I want to address the elephant in the medical room, and that is, what is cancer? Because everybody, you can meet anybody anywhere in the street and you say, have you ever met anybody who had cancer? Have you ever known anybody? Have you ever lost anybody? Cancer's touched our lives in some way, shape, or form. But it seems like it's this big label, to me at least, it seems like it's this big label for a lot of different things. And I know you said that treating cancer as one thing is like treating the continent of Africa as one country. But I still don't think we get what cancer is. So can you just give us an understanding of that? When I became interested in cancer, I was a teenager. And the reason I got interested was, Doug, that within our bodies, we are giving birth to literally a new species. Cancer is like a new species because from the moment it's born, it treats the rest of the body as an adverse environment as if it's an enemy it has to survive against and fight against. I found it intellectually really fascinating that we are giving birth to a new species that can live forever. In other words, if we can unlock the secret of cancer, we can unlock the secret of aging or immortality. That's how I got interested in cancer. And I asked myself the same thing, what is cancer? Because there are 200 different types of cancers. Right. But there is a convergent evolution that there are certain things, in fact, two properties that are common to every cancer. This is why we call it as one disease, but many varieties, depending on what organ it appears, what stage it appears, what is the environment like, what is the host conditions like. But the two things that define cancer, number one is a cell that can ignore growth inhibitory signals. So it can autonomously, continuously proliferate without paying any attention to what messages or signals it's getting from outside. That's number Every cancer cell does that. Number two, cancer cells do not mature. So every cancer cell is an immature, primitive cell. Hmm. It just lives to divide in two. It serves no useful function. So lives, divides in two. Prepares to divide in two, divides. Prepare. That's all it does. And it ignores growth inhibitory signals to do so. And these two properties are seminal to the identity of cancer. But it's like pneumonia. When somebody has pneumonia, it could be because of a virus, a bacterium. It could be due to a fungus. It could be due to exposure to asbestos some toxin, the cause could be anything. But the manifestation, the bodily manifestation is consolidation of the lungs. And that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. Like cancer initiation may have many causes, but the way it manifests itself is these two properties. So there's a lot to unpack there. I mean, first of all, as you said, this idea of immortality in that it doesn't get old. It doesn't get old and it doesn't die until it kills off the host, right? That in and of itself is, like you said, it's an alien species inside of our own body. Is like, wow. I mean, visions of the movie Alien suddenly sort of come to mind. But you know what I mean? It's like it's this other thing living inside that's consuming the host. That for me is it, in itself fascinating. But also that it doesn't mature is very interesting to me in that it has a very simple purpose. So like this alien creature, it's just divide and grow, divide and grow, divide and grow. And so, as you said, 200 different types, but they're doing the basic same thing. So from your point of view, because you're on the cutting edge of this, do we, like I remember being a kid and even my mom talk about people who died with the big C, which is what it was called back in the UK in those years. And I know millions upon, well, 
probably more than millions, probably billions have been spent on cancer research. We've all put some money in a jar with a yellow daffodil on it or something on cancer research, and I never feel like it gets any further. Is that my ignorance? Help me understand that, because it does feel a bit like an uphill battle that is never, it's kind of like we're fighting cancer. It, it just is going to keep going. Has there been any great advancement? Simple answer is no. In my opinion, no. And I'll tell you why I say that. By the way, the book I wrote, The First Cell, there is a subtitle to it. And the human costs of pursuing cancer to the last. Right. So one thing I did is finally look at or finally force everybody in the field to look at cancer from the perspective and prism of human anger. Okay. Tell us more about that. What is it patients are going through? So, in summary, 70% of cancers we diagnose today are cured. Cured? Yes. Is that good news? Of course, it's good news that they're being cured. But being cured with what? With paleolithic caveman kinds of treatment. The slash poison and burn. Why are women's breasts being slashed after hundreds of years? Yes. And why are we giving chemotherapy, which is literally dumb, what? like giving, taking a baseball bat and beating a dog with it to get rid of its fleas? That's what we are doing with chemotherapy. It's inhuman. And the problem is, why are we continuing to have to use such brutal measures? The second problem is that 30% patients that we are not curing is because they presented at an advanced stage of the disease. And their outcome is no different than it was 100 years ago. So the question I have is, okay, the 70% you're curing is with the same drug. You made minor differences here and there. Supportive care is a little better type of thing. But where has a trillion dollars gone in the last 50 years sunk into research, where has that trillion dollars gone in terms of improving outcome? Our common friend Perry, you know, he and I had a conversation about how come you've not been hung, drawn and quartered uh, because you're battling inside of your own system, the medical system, and you're saying things that are unspeakable to be crass about it. There's a lot of money in cancer. There's a lot of money in cancer treatment. There's a lot of money for big pharma, etc. And you're saying this, as you said, beating a dog to death with a baseball bat to get rid of his fleas is a ridiculous thing to do. So how do you explain, I don't mean for you to justify, how do you explain from what you're seeing about why we've moved forward so slowly, if at all, and why are we not open to far more effective measures? Yeah. Well, first, let me say that I did something important in that before I sent my book for publication, I reached out to the leadership of Columbia University. And I said to them that this is what I'm writing. I'm attacking the entire field. And if you have a problem with it, please point out the fatal flaw to me in my arguments now. Otherwise, forever, leap your peace. Shut up. Yeah. And because... So I told them that you are the leadership here. Mm -hmm. You have to support me in what I'm saying because I don't want to go out and say things to others and be thrown to the dogs as if I have no support. You tell me if I'm saying something wrong. And if I'm not, you have to support me. And the leader at the time, Gary Schwartz, was very kind. And he said, why don't you give grand rounds, Asra? And let us hear what you have to say. So I did that and everybody is sitting in the room and I presented my case to why we have to take off the blinders from our eyes and why we have to stop patting ourselves on the back, declaring victory for improving the survival of 30% patients by 2.1 months and claiming that it's a game-changing therapy. It has to stop. And the reasons for our failure and what we must do next, I presented it all. But looking at it in all of this, what are we doing to patients? And do you know what? At the end of my presentation, Gary Schwartz is the one who got up and he said, Asra, you were before just our scientific leader. Now you're also our spiritual leader and you will have our full support. So that really helped me because I don't want to be treated like a maverick or an outsider. I'm not. 
I am an academic researcher and professor of medicine and I'm seeing patients for 35 years. I've dedicated my whole life to this. I don't want to be treated as if I'm some ineffective, inexperienced, not knowledgeable voice. Not at all. I have to be treated as someone to be taken with credibility and seriously. And I got that backing, which gave me a lot of confidence, of course, to go out as an insider hitting from the inside. Of course, when the book came out, it was treated as if I've written the satanic verses. Nobody wanted to know. Nobody wanted to acknowledge what I'm saying. And that is not surprising at all because, look, I'm telling people to do things differently. Now, there are two kinds of people who can take the risk. Those who are just starting their careers can take the risk and follow my advice and not go after every last cell but try to find the first cell. Well, there is a risk for failure in doing something new. And when you're starting your career, you can't risk failure. So the poor kids, they can't do it. And what about the older crowd? Well, if you've spent 30 years studying mouse models to find a cure for human disease, you don't know what, to, what else to do. You're not going to change. So then who changes? And when you ask me, why are we not moving forward at the pace we should have? I'll answer you in one sentence and we can explore that further because cancer is complicated. That's the piece for me that I'm interested in because, you know, you're talking about first cell detection and oftentimes it's very advanced cell detection and even, quote, early detection is a long way from first cell, right? From what you're talking about. So you and I had talked about this when we'd had a previous conversation. We detect cancer through some kind of anomaly, something's going on, and we're testing that. Help us understand this concept, because it's quite vast, of first cell. Because that seems like, well, okay, and I'm going to make stuff up here because I want you to correct me. So it seems like, well, okay, I'll have a full body scan, because those are now coming online. I'll have a full body scan. And something will show up in a single cell. But how many cells do I have in my body? Oh, trillions. Okay, how are we going to get to that first cell? It seems like what you're presenting seems, certainly within the realm of what we have today, impossible. Well, the first thing is that, look, cancer is a silent killer, which means that even in stage one cancer, when it's detected at the earliest possible stage, when it becomes apparent on scanning devices like PET scans, CAT scans, etc., or it is picked up by biomarkers that exist right now, it already has hundreds of millions of cells. Yes. And so the problem is we are constantly trying to now get at these cells. Well, after about uh, 100 years and plus of research, things go in cycles. Uh, one advance happens and the arrogance of researchers like me, I'm included in all of them, is such that we think, okay, we are going to be able to cure this with this new technology we have developed. No, technology is a far cry from actually studying the disease and doing something. Right. So first it was molecular biology. Then it was we are going to just sequence the human genome and we'll cure all disease. Didn't happen. It's over no. 22 years later, 24 years later now. And we are no better off sequencing. Well, when that didn't work, let's sequence every cancer on earth. And we spent billions of dollars sequencing every type of cancer. It turned out that 95% do show mutation, but there are too many of them. <laughs> And that it's a very complicated disease, differing from tumor to tumor in the same patient, from clone to clone in the same tumor in the same patient, from wow. organ to organ in the same patient. It's not the same disease when it's in the liver or it's in the pancreas. The same breast cancer cells which originated in the breast, when they are in the liver, they are not behaving like they did in the breast. So, so they change on their environment. Yeah, they... Wow. They adapt themselves to the environment. So the issue is that cancer is always one step ahead or a thousand steps ahead of us. How do we then find this cancer early enough? Because the only good news you can give a cancer patient once you give them the diagnosis is that don't worry, we caught it early and we can take care of it. Right. But in 30%, you can't say that because 30% patients will present with advanced disease. 
And so then how do you find cancer early? Not in just the 30%, but even in the 70% who we are curing with horrifying measures. The only way is to find the first cell, which you can only find in people who don't have cancer yet, but who are at risk of getting cancer or even healthy people. So you ask me, well, I'm healthy and can I just go get a scan and find my cancer at the first cell? My answer is no, you can't because first of all, how often can you have these scans? The most common frequency would be once a year. Mm -hmm. Mostly they'd say once every five years at your age. But then a lot can happen in that one year in between. The first yeah. cell can arise somewhere in between. And by the time it becomes apparent on one of the scanning devices, it's already stage one because it's apparent now, which means it's millions of cells. Even that is early and it can be cut out, but again, a brutal disfiguring measure. Then how do you find it early? As I said, our arrogance was such that we felt that we will be able to find a mutation for which we will have a magic bullet which will cure cancer. It's not going to happen. We are not going to find any one drug that cures cancer. That is a magic bullet that shuts off a protein. It's not going to happen. I just want to go back for a moment and remind you that the last century, first 50 years, we were able to double human lifespan just by finding antibiotics. Yes. But not just discovering penicillin and antibiotics, but actually vaccination is what really revolutionized medicine. It was the prevention of infectious diseases, not treatment. Even today, if someone presents with end-stage sepsis, it's really hard to save them with the best antibiotics. We have to treat early, right? Mm -hmm. And the way we changed, we doubled human lifespan was by preventive vaccination. Then in the next 50 years of last century, we brought down cardiac mortality by 70%. Once again, not because we were doing heart transplants after MIs, no. And not also by coronary artery bypass surgeries or stenting, but by anti-cholesterol drugs, by insisting on changing lifestyles. You see what I'm saying? Yes. It's always preventive, Prevent. just finding as early and preventing. But with cancer, we are not using that strategy. With cancer, we have to go find every last cell and kill it. It's completely, I think, delusional to think we can do that. Simple as that. Cancer is such a malevolent, such a horrifying illness. You have to see it in patients to realize how malignant it really is. Mm -hmm. And one of the sentences I've written in the book, which I want to quote myself, is that the unfortunate thing is that researchers of cancer, most of them, are studying a disease they never see because they're not MDs. They're not taking care of patients. They're basic scientists. They study a disease that they never see in animals who don't get it spontaneously. So it's such an artificial system we have created that a scientist sitting in a lab who's never seen a cancer patient is going to take a mouse and take some damaging thing and try to damage the DNA or take some tumor cells from a human kill the mouse's immune system completely, make these tumor cells grow, then treat those cells with some treatment that they come up with and claim it's a cure for cancer and bring it to the bedside. Well, 95% of drugs or treatments brought to the bedside by these preclinical testing platforms on animals, 95% fail. And the 5% that succeed should have failed because they're only prolonging survival for 30% patients by 2.1 months. So that's outrageous. So if it is about prevention, is the answer lifestyle? Is the answer that we should eat this, not eat that, do this, not do that? I mean, I know you talk about inflammation, and I know there was a lot of talk from, well, certainly in more recent years about how cancer feeds on sugar and sugars in the system and, and stripping the sugar out. I'm an amateur, but, you know, should we be more keto or more even primal in our eating in order to keep those uh, sugars out of our system and not feed that? Is that the answer or is there something else? Given the frailties of human nature, we cannot depend on people to have 
the best, healthiest lifestyle. They're not no. to do it. We have to find an ozempic like miracle to do that, which we right. So I'm afraid that you can have the most pristine lifestyle, eat the healthiest food, exercise and have the best genes. Your parents live to be over 100 and yet you can get cancer. Mm -hmm. So a lifestyle is not all by itself, but definitely it matters because just common sense is that if you got a cancer at 50 years of age with the pristine lifestyle, if you didn't have that lifestyle, you would have gotten the cancer at 20 years of age. So it probably prolonged it at least. So lifestyle is not the answer. The answer is very simple. We need to find cancer early, which means we cannot do annual exams for cancer. No, we need to treat the human body as a machine and monitor it 24-7 for signs of disease-caused perturbation. And that's very easy to do, Doug. This is not magic. It's all doable with the current technology. We have all these compartments. We have saliva, urine, feces, hair, nails, blood. Blood is not such an aggressive. I mean, it is an invasive procedure, but drawing up blood is not exactly the same as drilling into the bone to find bone marrow, very painful. So with these kinds of technologies, we can detect the earliest of cancer, once we detect them, the question I ask myself, Doug, is why is a first cell even appearing? What is causing this cell to appear? And someone asked me, do you think cancer is something we are born with, we live with it, it's natural, it's in our bodies anyway, and it just manifests itself? And I said, yes, of course, because cancer cell is a normal cell that has started to misbehave. Yes, mutated. Yeah, so, no. That's wrong. It's, I mean, sorry, not wrong, but it's only part of the story. Okay, good. Uh, yeah, a cancer I, I like cell... being wrong. I like it when you correct me. <laughs> I, I like learning. And if you want to correct me and I'm wrong, please do so. I won't be insulted. Yeah. I'll be, I'll be ecstatic. <laughs> okay, good. Well, the thing is that to think about genes all the time, a mutation immediately means a genetic mutation, that a yes. gene has is now got a defect in it. I think that's too reductionist an approach, okay. not I think, but there's enough proof to know that that's too reductionist because 5% cancers don't have a single mutation that is associated with any cancer at all. Oh, okay. So how are they getting it? Well, the idea here is that it's more of a cell issue. The whole cell is involved, but not just the cell. Why is the cell misbehaving? What happened? And that's what I want to just spend a couple of minutes explaining to you. So let's say that cancer is something which is associated with aging. The older we grow, the higher the chance of getting cancer. Of course, there is pediatric cancer, but think of these numbers. If there are 2 million cancer patients, new cancer patients diagnosed in America in 2024, 2 million, 15,000 will be in children. So the number is minuscule, right, for children. Mm -hmm. And as we grow older, after 50 years of age, there's a steep climb. Although right now we are seeing a steep climb between 40 and 30 and 50 as well for certain cancers like colorectal cancers are really like going up for unknown reasons. Then the question is, why is age the most dangerous carcinogen? What is it about age? It's the same as being exposed to toxins. It's the same as getting an infection. I'll explain to you. Let's say in the liver, we get a hepatitis B virus infection. The virus is now proliferating inside the cells. It starts killing off the cells and sets up an inflammatory reaction. Blood starts sending immune cells to try and fight this infection. They send immune cells in to clear the debris that is coming out of dying cells. You know, a whole battlefield is now growing in the liver. This is called an inflammatory process. In this inflammatory process, cells which are living there, the liver cells, are stressed because they're being told fight or flight, either develop a strategy to survive or you're going to die. And one strategy they develop to survive is two cells fuse together, boom, two stressed cells. If they fuse together, what do they do? Immediately, they've doubled their genome. Now they have twice as many genes as they need. They don't have time to undergo a mutation and try to survive. No. They're under threat to die now. They have to develop a strategy now. 
So another of my contentions is that the first cell is not one cell, it's actually two cells. But the interesting thing is that only in one disease, cancer, can cells walk out of their organs of origin. You see, if the body is like a state and cells are its citizens, one of the rules they have to follow is they live inside the organs all their lives, like liver cells stay in the liver, brain cells in the brain, ovarian cells in the ovary. Only in one disease they walk out of the organ of origin. Ovarian cells end up in the brain, in the lungs, in the liver. So are they behaving like stem cells? Well, stem cells don't walk out. No, but stem cells can be different things, right? A stem cell can develop into one organ or another organ. It has the adaptability. I get that these are crossing a line. You know, these are not uh, behaving like stem cells. These are behaving as completely new phenomenon. And so the question is, how have they become mobile? And this was one of the two questions that fascinated me intellectually about cancer as a teenager. One, the immortality part, how does it become immortal? And two, how does it develop the mobility to walk out of the organs? And that's the answer I found is that, in fact, the stressed cell in the liver we were talking about doesn't fuse with a second liver cell, but occasionally will fuse with a blood cell. Now it's sitting inside a blood cell, it's mobile, it can go anywhere. You see what I'm saying? And that's where this whole cell is involved in the cancer process. But not just the whole cell. It's the immune system is involved. It's the microenvironment in which this cancer is developing. Because you can't just take something out of context. And this idea that there is a mutation that has caused the cell to misbehave. Well, after 50 years of subscribing to this reductionist notion, where's the proof? Name one gene associated with one cancer that is consistently there in that cancer. No, you'll find that except for one which is BCR able and chronic myeloid leukemia, but that's a different story. 199 out of 200 cancers. You can say, oh, RAS gene is mutated. Well, there are a lot of cancers where RAS gene is not mutated. P53 is a problem. No, a lot. So there is no gene that's related to cancer as such. In fact, we have become so blinded by whatever hypothesis we proposed, following it, and then it's that sunken cost effect. You have invested so much into this model that you just can't backtrack now. So we're already at the end of part one. I want to get into part two, but I really want to explore this idea that if, and again, I may be misunderstanding, if cancer is not a genetic mutation, what the heck might it be? And if it goes up in people as they age, or the potentiality of it goes up in, in what they age, is the work of people like Dr. David Sinclair in age reversal and looking at how he's been able to reverse the aging of cells, does that now reduce the potential for cancer? So there's a lot to dig into, including your own story, which is a profound and moving story. We want to get into part two of the show. Ezra, this is it's such an honor to have you here. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. And obviously, as I said at the beginning, you're a very busy lady. Please tell people where they can find out more about you and how they can participate in what it is that you're doing. Well, thank you so much, Derb. Very easy to find me. Just my name, azraraza.com. Put it in Google and you will come up with my website and it has all the information you need. I have over 100 videos explaining my ideas in it and uh, also explaining the anguish of patients through poetry and through a lot of different ways because patients are the most important thing to me. And the elephant in the room of all cancer meetings to me is always the patient who's not talked about. And that is the obsession I have, that we have to do better by our patients. You can find all of that on my website. The humanization of the impact of cancer rather than the treatment of a thing. I love that. Love that. Thank you so much. We're going to be back for part two of the show in just one click. So... I really encourage you to stay curious about how we look at cancer. And again, please understand, you may not be struggling with this, but I guarantee you've known somebody who has or is. I presently can think of three people in my life who are struggling with it. So right now, I would like for you to really be thinking about what this means and consider what your questions might be as you're coming to part two of the show. 
Stay curious, my friends. Stay curious. We'll see you in just one click.